You're listening to The Sister Trill with Danai and Kibeli. Hello, welcome back to The Sister Trill. I'm Danai. And I'm Kibeli. And today we will be talking about our musical journey. We're both pianists and we will be going into depth about everything related to that, growing up, playing the piano. But before we talk about it, first we will discuss what we disagreed on this week. So okay, you go first. Okay, I go first. So this week we had a little discussion about how we enter the bed during the day. How and if we oh, enter yeah. the bed <laughs> during yes. the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because basically what happened? Oh yeah, we were lying. No, I mean, we were not lying in bed, but <laughs> <laughs> we were in the room of a friend and you were kind of lying on the bed fully dressed mm -hmm. and then you said because you knew that that friend doesn't really like it you said oh sorry I'm lying on your bed mm -hmm. and then we got into that discussion because I am somebody who doesn't like to get into the bed during the day fully clothed in street clothes I find that especially going under the covers this is something very triggering to me going under the covers in jeans or in whatever I'm wearing during the day the thing that I'm like wearing outside on the uh, public transport, like everything sitting in the grass going into bed. I find that very weird. I, I think that you should go into bed in your pajamas that are clean, that have not seen the things that are outside no. the dirt and and you like to go to bed well no no i don't i don't like going to bed but you don't clothes. you don't mind i, I mean I, i have to concede that as the years have gone by i do it less and less like at yeah. this point i don't think i would go under the covers in my clothes but okay. i would like uh, go on my bed because i have like an extra blanket on my mm -hmm. actual blanket like in my clothes but generally i would say i'm i'm far less squirmish about these type yeah. of things yeah. so like, i mean yeah in a situation where it'd be super dead and i just want to kind of like lie on my bed I'm just gonna do it you know if yeah. friends are over and kind of lots of friends that are lying on my bed I'm kind of very easy going about that like it's not going to bother me I know people that you know it, it find I'm it really, very bothersome yeah. if like suddenly jeans hit the covers or something like that yeah so, like, it, I find on top of the covers is, is a different acceptable yeah. but under yeah, yeah. the no, covers I, I mean it's not something I do I, I would I, I make a habit of yeah generally I like when I'm at home to just wear comfortable clothes anyway but it's definitely something I wouldn't completely yeah. find disgusting if it ended up you happening. know how some musicians in hotel rooms which I also find so weird like when they have a nap you know pre-concert nap yeah. they just go under the covers in their fully dressed I've things. done that <laughs> I, I don't understand. I don't understand how you can nap yeah. in your street clothes. Okay, under I'll, the I'll, no, but here's the, the the situation as it pertains to me in that situation is that when I am really really tired and especially like it's it, it has this vibe of a 20 minute power nap, there is a vibe, a mood that I'm in where I love kind of you know like yeah getting in my comfy clothes, yeah. getting my pajamas, or you know sometimes just taking all the clothes off. It also has a very you know like interesting kind of homey vibe. So um, there is there is that, but sometimes the the kind of privilege of just being able to close your eyes in that instant mm. that you're super tired and just doze off for those 20 minutes, have that power nap. Sometimes it's just such a overwhelmingly kind of fun thing to do <laughs> where you're like, I don't even have to do anything else. I'm just going to close my eyes and let, you know, my, my body take over for 20 minutes. Yeah. That sometimes that kind of, I would say, supersedes mm. the desire for the, oh, I'm like, you know, first going to get into my comfortable stuff. I yeah. see. Okay, so the thing that I came up with that we disagreed on, which, by the way, is something that is going to happen, but you kind of tried to talk me out of it, because <laughs> next week we're celebrating Danai's older son's fourth birthday party. Oh. <laughs> and... Um, I generally like to create events with multiple highlights, not just one. So we've already planned kind of an elaborate event with many little playstations and everything. But I thought that there is one thing, it kind of literally just came to me in that moment, that I'm sure he would love, which is to have a piñata there. And not fill it with sweets. Like I'm all on board the let's not give the kids too much sweets stuff. and stuff. But like fill it with like quite specifically I'd found like this huge package of like PJ Masks goodies and Paw Patrol goodies that I know that they're currently into. So I like to fill it with like Paw Patrol goodies. And it's like this super fun thing. Everyone's gonna love it. Like both your older and your young are gonna love to just like, you know, hit that piñata then when all this stuff comes out and it's all pop they're gonna love it. So um, for some reason you were not completely enthused by that idea. <laughs> Idea. No, I, I I just want to explain. Okay. Um, 
Generally, I like the idea. I just had two things in my mind. All right. One thing was the complete mess that's going to happen we'll do after it outside. That. But Problem solved. Yeah, that's not the big... And the other thing somehow I had in my mind is kids with big sticks hitting on it and then accidentally like swinging backwards and hurting each other. And I was just imagining the boys, you know, like Got swinging it. them we're like gonna, We're going to be taking turns. Basically like one or two people yeah. at the same time. This and is the what rest I was thinking like, like okay, there's the swinging stick and they might hurt each other. This is the only thing that's holding me back. Okay. We're going to find solutions for those find two things for because a piñata with Paw Patrol stuff in it, oh my God, he's going to love it. Got it. Okay, so it's happening. It's Basically, happening. it has been Basically, decided yes. on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. All right. So let's so, get to, into our like exactly. musical history. So basically, we thought that our general music story is so public. We don't really want to get into that. If you want to know it, I mean, we can give you a super quick overview. We both started playing the piano very young. We both started at the music school. I was at the music school for a little bit longer. I started at the age of six and stayed at the music school until I was 11. And I started, well, actually you started more when you were five because yeah. I started when I was four yeah. and I stayed until I was seven years and old. And then simultaneously, so when I was 11 and Kiveli was seven, we changed teachers and we started studying at the university with our teacher, Karl-Heinz Kemmerling, who was a very big, uh, respected piano professor at the time. And sadly, he passed away now, what, almost 10 years ago, right? No, yeah. nine years nine ago. Nine years. So yeah. he, we studied with him for 10 years. Yeah, exactly. We studied with him for 10 years. So... Probably our main shaping time, I would say, was with him. And then we changed again to the same teacher who was a former student of his as well um, and studied with him. Last forked. Exactly. So this is kind of the very general like overview. Like the biography uh, exactly. overview. Exactly. But you can find all the details about that uh, in any platform and interview. So we thought <laughs> that we would focus on the more interesting stuff. Yes. So basically, the first question I wanted to ask you is, when you started out, like really, I'm talking about the first years, mm -hmm. did you ever see it as like the future thing you will do in your life? Or was it a pure hobby for you? Mm -hmm. Like was practicing a chore or was, mm -hmm. was it fun? Like, what, what was the entire thing for you? It's, it's interesting because I don't remember a time where it wasn't the absolute dream to become mm -hmm. a, a concert pianist. Mm. I specifically remember that, you know, every time um, when like there would be an eyelash <laughs> situation where you know like you know you keep the eyelash between your fingers and you make a wish and you blow I it away I think that's a Greek thing but I don't know if it's so uh, really? universal no it's also an American it is? thing come on okay. it's all like you know in the wrong but just for people it's... to understand so if you have an eyelash you can make a wish and it's going to come true exactly yeah, yeah. so and I would always wish for I want to become a concert pianist when I'm older yeah and mm. and, and it's interesting because I cannot say why like mm. whether it was kind of our parents and, and it definitely wasn't our parents gearing us towards the professional direction I mean what I, I do remember is that our parents were very much the type of parents you know you can do whatever you like but you do your best at whatever yeah, you like exactly. so you have to, you have to take yeah, it seriously give it a real shot exactly yeah. so there was definitely like it wasn't just how we're going to you know go pay for a music school and you're just going to practice 20 minutes a week like that never happened from mm -hmm. the first moment we started I mean you definitely as well but it was always expected that we would put in you know the work which in the beginning is obviously significantly less work than later on but still it was for for a four-year-old and a five-year-old it was a lot of time it was daily which is already a thing so um I, I don't know why it was so clear but I think it was a combination of things people since I can remember have told me I'm musical mm -hmm. like ah you're so talented it was always a thing like ah you've got so much talent and and you know at a point where I couldn't judge whether that was true or not the only thing I do remember is that I would always sit on the piano and I remember remember like the thought process I was like okay if I move my body in slow circular motion and close my eyes at the same time <laughs> that seems to make people say that I'm musical what? so like I remember for for and that and that was also at before I started playing the piano because Denai started playing four years well three years earlier than me and um I for like there was this time where I was trying to convince my parents that I wanted to start as well yeah and like the, one of the main driving factors was also your music teacher who was kind of supporting the idea of me starting as well and she would always say ah she's so, she's got mm. so much talent started out started out and every time I would get the chance to be at the piano I would like do this technique of like moving super slow and pretending like I'm deep in motion <laughs> That's funny. And, and obviously it paid off <laughs> I mean for me 
I, I don't think I ever thought about the professional thing in the beginning, mm-hmm. like in the very beginning, because we do not come from a musical family. Mm-hmm. It really was a hobby for me. I think it was probably also a bit different because I, I was already playing quite intensely when you started. Mm-hmm. When I started, nobody was doing anything yeah, yeah, intensely. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it really was a hobby. And I think it all changed when I started doing competitions, which competitions started happening quite early. Right. I mean, my first was competition a year, like within the yeah, first year. My first competition, I remember it when I was six I years also old. Remember first I remember I didn't expect anything. I mean, I thought I couldn't judge it at all. I thought yeah. I could get the like I could get nothing. I could get the fr- like I, I didn't really know what I was going to get. And Which one was it? Was it Jung Musizia? It was Jung you? Musizia, okay. yeah. yeah. And it was and I and I got the first prize with the highest possible points. And to me, it was like, what really? You know, I, okay. I didn't expect it at all. I really didn't know what to expect, basically. Mm-hmm. I was just going there for fun. But after that competition, when I suddenly got the first prize with the highest points, suddenly I thought, okay, okay, I seem to be good at this. And right. then, of course, the next competition was already, okay, let's win what this again. What was your second one? It was Jung Musizia again. Okay. Um, but with piano four hands. All right. But because first I yeah, did yeah, piano yeah, solo, yeah. then piano four hands. And then I think it already was this other one, Goldhenstein. Right, Steinweg. Yeah, because my yeah. first one was Goldhenstein. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember. I, re- I remember the repertoire I played. I remember this first competition so vivid, I re- vividly. I remember the the hall. I mean, we ended up doing these because these are like the kind classical. of the the classic competition circuit, youth competition circuit that you do. They usually run. I mean, the, the one the Goldhern Steinweg is only for pianists. The Jugendmusiziert is the biggest youth competition in Germany that it runs for all instruments, for all chamber music combinations. I think. I think and it has point, three rounds. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it starts um, at the regional level. And then when you're old enough, I'm not sure what that age is, like eight, nine, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it goes to the state level. You can level. get to the state level. And then um, after that, again, when you're old national. enough, like 12, 13, it gets to the national level. Yeah. And exactly. So um, obviously in the first few times we did it, we were only on the regional level because we were too young. And then it kind of goes yeah. on. And, and then the national level is actually, I would say, f- quite competitive for you know, being, for still going to school, for people that still go to school. Yeah. And there are many kind of agencies that scout talent there. That's and true, yeah. I would say like for both of us, we we, we got a lot of um, connections to people that then would, you know, kind of be our gateway to the music business world yeah. through, for example, also yeah. this competition. But uh, to get back to the first one, I remember, first of all, the repertoire I played. Mm. I also remember like in short flashes how it felt playing on, on like playing the competition. I don't remember being nervous, like the feeling of being nervous, mm-hmm. but I remember that I, like the, the, it was heightened, the situation was heightened. And then I remember that um, I was sitting on, I think, our nanny's lap when the prizes were being mm-hmm. given out. And that was at a point where, you know, like you would sit there and then it was like, okay, third prize goes to blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, second goes to blah, blah. And like after I hadn't gotten the third and the second, I was like unsure. At this point, you know, the fact that our family is, you know, good enough to get first prizes had been kind of clear, but still, you know, like it was my first competition. And then I remember that the the person said, and first prize goes, of course, to <laughs> Kiveri Zürgen. And I was like, and I, and, and I remember I just like kind of jumped up off the nanny's <laughs> lap and like quite confidently went and like got my, like this, whatever it was, like a paper that said first prize <laughs> and got back and, and, you know, like... As if it was all super clear. And I was like, oh my God, I won the first prize. I loved it. (laughs) No, for me, it wasn't clear at all. And I didn't know, you know, whether I wanted to hear my name or not hear it. Like whether I would be happy Mm -hmm, to hear it. mm -hmm. Because they were also going, you know, from lowest to highest. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, And But but it was kind of like funny. And then when they hadn't... uh, said my name and we were already because the highest you can get is 25 points we were already well, 24 one. Yeah, yeah. points I was kind of like okay wow I'm gonna probably yeah. get the highest and then I remember I didn't really even understand did I get it now did I not then suddenly they said my name and my mom was like go on stage like get your thing and I was like <laughs> okay and, <laughs> yeah but but yeah it was it was totally fun but after that I remember this competitiveness is what started mm-hmm. to make me practice Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this is really which I think is probably quite normal when you do a hobby as a young kid yeah yeah. exactly Mm -hmm. you always have some kind of competitive thing or some kind of match or depending on what you're doing Mm -hmm. and then it was really going from competition to competition and wanting to win everyone and basically going for the first prize every single time yeah yeah yeah, yeah, so so when would you say um did this moment happen when practicing became 
let's say, a, a chore or something where it was clear, okay, I have to do this every mm-hmm. day. This is who I am. This is my thing. This is this is my jam. I mean, I think from the beginning it was, I mean, the, okay, I mean, now we have to, there are so many things we can get into in that. I mean, <laughs> also the fact that we, we our, our mother was, very present in our musical journey like she was and because we we don't come from a a musical family no, no no one in our family has done something artistic it's all actually very inclined in a business direction yeah, financial um, economics and financial yeah. stuff so um but but our mother wanted like did did very ba- ba- ballet very intensely when she was young so maybe like she had kind of you know the spirit of wanting to do something more artistic as well mm. because what ended up ended up happening is she was uh, there in every lesson um, and writing down like all the uh, remarks from the teacher and she practiced with me every day for way too long to be honest but <laughs> for a very long time and also with you with me for also a long for time. a very long time yeah I mean which uh, uh, f- definitely you know we feel ambivalent about it especially yeah. towards the end because we feel we could have you yeah. know done it by ourselves at some point but I do think that of oh, course no, it would I mean, have been impossible in the beginning yeah, yeah. this is exactly yeah. what you need and yeah 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 w- I mean, only if you have a parent like that. Yes. Do you because get no five-year-old is gonna, yeah. no five-year-old is gonna be like, ah, do you know what I want to do today? I want to practice two hours of piano. You exactly. Know? <laughs> I mean, th- that's the thing. You know, people always ask us, "Do you like to practice?" And mm-hmm. of course, we also always said, "Yeah, it's fun." And for me, I mean, tell me how it was for you. But for me personally, th- there was definitely truth to it. I did like to practice. I did mm-hmm. like being at the piano and discovering things but of course not every day would I have voluntarily Mm. sat at the piano and of course I needed my mom to tell me piano time you know that it was a thing it was a routine thing piano time after school for three hours practice do your stuff and you know get into that whole scales studies repertoire I didn't like it for a very long time I didn't like it yeah (laughs) and I I remember for a very long time my narrative was that I love performing Mm. I love giving concerts and I love the feeling both on stage as well as you know the feeling of accomplishment afterwards and of achievement um and the practicing is just a necessary thing that goes in order to get that high Mm. for a very long time for a very very long time that was what it was and then when we started um doing also master classes and our whole kind of identity got shaped around it much more when we did the you know made the jump from the music school to the university then of course it became more than just uh, other the few concerts of course it became a lifestyle I became an identity, became who I was. So I would say it was very hard to separate just the plain practicing from everything else I loved because then I started also loving the process of, for mm-hmm. example, getting to master a piece and, mm-hmm. and getting further in your practicing. I remember what I always loved, for a very long time, what I loved doing most is learning new repertoire. You know, when you are when you are young, you learn, you, you kind of... Um, work at one piece for a very long time and f- there was like for many years maybe between the age of like eight and 15 I would say practicing was always a combination of re-practicing your mm-hmm. core pieces for ages and just going through the yeah. same exercises through the same routines what a luxury um, I know, thinking about I know, it at this now. point yeah, I, yeah. I, I wish I could yeah, do that yeah, right yeah. now so, so so going through the same routine and then also trying to kind of develop new repertoire. And I always much preferred the stimulating mm. and, you know, curiosity-driven process of learning new repertoire than kind yeah. of going through the routine. So, but but to kind of um, get to the point about the practice thing, for a very long time, I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like it because... A combination of things just I don't think I'm the type of person that likes this kind of solitary uh doing it you know by yourself mm. there was definitely a lot of um I would say uh challenging components with our mother connected to it that always led to a lot of conflict as well and so there, there were lots of things that made it not necessarily pleasant what switched what made it switch for me is when I stopped going from a perspective of practicing and to a perspective of discovering and when I started understanding that I, I was discovering either new pieces or just you know new depths of a given piece mm. and now at this point point whenever I practice I don't see it as oh just plain practice but I see it as discovering a piece either again Mm -hmm. from a new perspective or completely a new piece and I have to say even the plain scales things 
I mean, at this point, I just love also just the feeling of it, you know, of yeah. when you play a scale and you feel your fingers, like, not because you haven't practiced in a long time, just because you've woken up or something, and you're, you're, you're kind of, you're getting that flexibility into your fingers and that strength, and I love, I, I just love the entire, in, entire process. Yeah, at this point, it's just your appreciation for the whole craft. And also just there. music making. And, but yeah. it took, and I always remember that, Partly because you're the type of person to make the best out of any situation and maybe kind of also uh, convince yourself into yeah. liking things that you might not necessarily like in a natural way. You always kind of propagated that uh, opinion of liking practicing and you were like, no, I like practicing, I like practicing. And I was always, I had to be, you know, mm. I would say also disciplined into yeah. it for a long time. No, for me, I I definitely liked it way more than you. <laughs> and also I think a, a big role was how I started to get into this whole world of practicing because, you know, for you it was kind of just there mm -hmm. because I was doing it. But for me, with my first teacher, her name was Marina Kaifetz, it was a Russian piano yeah. teacher. So it was this Russian school, which I would say is also a bit different from the uh, German school yeah. that we had later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but she kind of took me under her wing and I think she's also a big part, played a very big part in why I even pursued this. Yeah. Um, because she kind of took me under her wing, I would say, boldly say that I was her favorite <laughs> student. <laughs> and... Um, And that she just said, you know, she, she really believed in me. And mm -hmm. she just said, we're going to do this. And she organized concerts for me. And she was the type of teacher that then traveled to the competition mm -hmm. with me. And, and she created this whole lifestyle you know she she told me you know when you practice what to look out for she started mm. this whole picture thing she she showed me the whole fun of it she went shopping with me for my concert dress yeah, you yeah, know yeah, yeah. we went shopping together we would mm. she would tell me what to eat before the concert like it was so intense the yeah. whole thing and yeah. to me it was very exciting this mm. whole thing and I I, I, I created this huge bond with my teacher and she was like, a, I mean, I idolized her and she was also kind of like a friend and I thought yeah. she was so cool and I thought she was so beautiful. You know, everything about her was just <laughs> like cool. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, also yeah. I played piano duo with her daughter yeah, a lot. Yeah, so yeah. I felt a very strong connection yeah. to this whole thing. And I think this really made the entire process exciting for me mm. also practicing at the music school I remember while you had a lesson I was practicing I was excited about this like yeah. this was a cool thing yeah, yeah, for yeah. me to do yeah. and then from there making the transition to Kemaling into this whole yes. new world yeah. of people yeah. Yeah. for me I actually for a while I would say liked practicing more than performing really okay. yeah because also and this is already the transition into yeah. the next topic I have one more thing to say about the practicing yeah. but go, go well basically the next topic I want to discuss is that phase that um, we both went f through and that I think probably every professional musician goes through that phase that I would like to call fear of performing <laughs> stage <laughs> fright stage fright yeah and this is where I really liked practicing more than performing I just was afraid of performing I loathed performing yeah. for a while I had nothing positive to connect to it Yeah, which from the perspective where I'm now is crazy because yeah. now I love performing. No, no, but I totally, but, I, I have yeah. that phase as well. Yeah. So but I before totally we get into it, what did you yeah, want Yeah, I mean, the, I think that, because I, I think back to it sometimes now, and of course there is this natural fact that of course you won't love practicing the way mm. you love it now when you're young and, you know, you don't really connect this whole, you know, deep meaning to it yeah. on a conscious level, but maybe yeah. more on an instinctive level. But I do think that one of the reasons why it was specifically hard for me is because I my the reason why I was practicing practicing was a bit skewed. I hadn't been really completely given the chance to practice in order to be like ambitious with my skills. Mm -hmm. My like the narrative that everyone was telling me is like you're so talented, you're so skilled, mm -hmm. you owe it to yourself to practice yeah. first of all and also like It, it was kind of I, I I wasn't really given the chance to do it for the right reasons. I was doing mm. it in order to you know not fight with our mother, in order to not fail, rather than in order right. to excel. You know, and I remember that it's totally true what you're saying. I remember everyone saying Kiveli is so musical. Everyone also telling me Kiveli is naturally more musical than you. <laughs> oh, but and and by the way, like I mean, no, I didn't actually feel so bad about it because I actually, I mean, I believe it until today. And and I I. 
remember also seeing it like back then I remember seeing that things came easier to you than they did to me like with well, less it came my practice. my my phase came where nothing came <laughs> easy to me no but I, I just mean I just mean the natural mm. being music like being musical and getting things quickly I feel like I had to work a little bit harder to get to certain points and also just a very simple thing singing I mean singing is a very big indicator of how musical you are mm -hmm. and I think we can very objectively say that you're the better singer from the two of us and I don't mean the you know the control of the voice I mean yeah. just listening wise mm -hmm. listening wise mm -hmm. like pitch wise mm -hmm. you're the better singer and I think this is already a big indicator of how musical someone yeah. is but anyway so let's get into the actual juicy stuff the, the stage actual fright, juicy because stuff, I think right. that's the most interesting yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Okay. so maybe we can start this off by saying what triggered stage fright for you like was it a bad performance mm -hmm. what what was it for you okay so I would say for me it kind of was there in a kind of it kind of in a dull ache in the back of my mm -hmm. mind, kind of growing and growing and growing, maybe ever since I was 13 years old, I would say. I would place it around 13 years old, it would start. But it, it and didn't why, why did it start? I would say just a general combination of puberty, generally mm -hmm. losing a bit of self-confidence, mm -hmm. being a bit more doubtful about myself as a whole, you know, losing that childish approach to everything, becoming much more aware about, you know, the fact that you're being watched on stage mm -hmm. and things can go wrong and um, people starting to expect greater things from you because you have been when you come up as a kind of child protege as as definitely I had been like you know thrust in this night I had been on tv shows with the like you know wonder child title and stuff and although I never identified with it I mean I remember specifically saying in that tv show I don't like that title mm -hmm. there is nothing wondrous about this it's all hard work you know and I, I remember that you know people had started expecting that things were easy for me mm -hmm. and when I started realizing that hang on it, it doesn't necessarily have to be easy lots of things can go wrong I started you know without admitting it to myself becoming more worried becoming more and more nervous feeling like I was on the edge of breaking at any point but I didn't break for a single time up until the one time that I just broke completely <laughs> like in spectacular fashion <laughs> and and it was a ho and, and that was what triggered it then where it just became okay. a pathology and you're afterwards. talking about the Chopin ballad I'm talking yeah. about the Chopin. Should, okay. should I first go that experience or do you want to first I mean, say basically, how you came up yeah no no I mean okay, so basically it was a very it was a very bad concert to mess up let's start there there could have been much nicer yeah. concerts to mess up than it was that a high one. pressure concert it was a high pressure concert it was at the end of a master class where our teacher had kind of placed me in a position of how I'm going to show off my good student because there were other professors in the audience as well. And I played, I mean, that was, I played that piece for one or two years quite uh, successfully, you and know. And securely. And, and securely, yeah. you know. I, it wasn't the first time I was playing that piece. It wasn't that I wasn't well prepared or anything like that. I played it the night before, actually, in, 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 in performance practice. And although I had already felt massively uncomfortable mm. it had gone well yeah and I, rem I already remember the preparation for the concert I did everything wrong I remember I was super nervous for some technical things which was already uncommon for me I was usually always afraid of the slow parts for maybe you know like forgetting memory slips, memory slips mm. or stuff but I was afraid of the technical parts in that and I remember I was just backstage we had a room with a piano just quickly playing I remember through. that I rem I still remember playing that. through like, like and I remember parts. telling you like don't do that. Yeah, you know, and, 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 and I, yeah. Just, I, I just thought with every time I was playing it backstage and it was working, as if I was kind of proving myself, okay, it's I working. I can do it. I it's working, it. yeah, it's yeah. working. But I was like obsessively playing yeah. it again and again and like just in in, in a panic, basically. I, I'm like there right now. <laughs> I, I, I remember what the room looked like. Yes. I remember everything. So then <laughs> I went on stage and the it was the, the piece was the, the first ballade, ballade in, in G minor by Chopin. And it starts out very, like, the, the piece starts out with a slow, like, the first two pages are slow and very musical, and then kind of it goes through, like, uh, I would say a sequence of technically challenging, then it goes back to slow. Technically challenging, goes back to slow. And every technical 
challenge is a different different technical challenge. Some are more scales, some are octaves, and in the end it's like core. In the end it's just difficult. <laughs> it's like chords, everything together. And I remember the slow parts were totally fine. I was like, it, it, I started off really beautifully, and then the first technical thing came, and I kind of did it, but already, I mean, I felt, I, I already knew, like, I had this kind of prophecy in my mind, this was going to go wrong. Mm. I, w- I wouldn't Basically, be able to catch it. Basically, would you say you knew in a way before that concert? In a way, in a way I knew, but in retrospect, you know, yeah. not that in that moment I could have told. Yeah. In that yeah. moment, I was still doing everything I could to control yeah. myself. It was the first time I was confronted with that situation. I had zero tools to deal mm. with, you know, fingers running away yeah. from you, being, yeah. you know. So in any case, I remember every technical place got subsequently worse and worse and worse till I reached the coda, which is the hardest of them all. And I remember, and the coda takes, it's three pages and about, I would say, one or two minutes long. And it ends with like, you know, it, it doesn't end very hard, but it ends with some scales and then some octaves and then like two chords, right? So I, I kind of played the introduction to the coda and then I, I can only describe it as the connection from my mind to my fingers was severed. It was just gone. And you just nothing, not, nothing worked. Like literally, I remember I, I started playing these chords and like nothing was, I was like, I felt like I was suddenly, I don't know, like, like I'd gotten an epiple- uh, 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 like ep- epileptic situation. Like nothing was working. And I, I, I in my panic, I remember I tried to play it like, you know, the first phrase comes twice. The second time it didn't work, I just like kind of stopped, pressed the pedal to hold on for dear life and um, went ahead and skipped to the scale part of it. Yeah. Thinking in my mind that since I've been playing scales since I was four years old, so at that point I'd been playing it for 10 years or 11 years, I think I was 14 or 15 years old, I must be able to put, able to pull off a scale. Think again, <laughs> I couldn't put off a scale. I like I just kind of you know, washed over the scales, washed over the second scale, washed over the octaves. I couldn't play anything anymore. I yeah. literally nothing. I mean, we should say that this is like, you know, obviously it's a total horror performance yeah. story, but it's also very common that this is mm. exactly what happens when a a pianist gets nervous literally you start rushing you start losing control of your fingers mm-hmm. and then what you just described is usually the pedal comes in because that somehow hides things but of course I mean at this point there's nothing I didn't to fool be anybody yeah. <laughs> and then you start rushing and then you just yeah you cannot deal with it anymore and the high point of it all is you feel like you you cannot even play the piano anymore you cannot even yeah. press a key and yeah um, and of course the problem with that pr- specific performance was that my teacher was in the audience yeah exactly Exactly. Trying to show you off, as you said. So, I yeah. mean, and I remember, like, and I was very interested in it because he wasn't mad at me. He, he, he obviously, he was, and he wasn't even that much disappointed in me, but he was just very, he, he looked at me with a very grave expression and kind of said something like, this is a, the beginning of a very difficult phase and we're going to have to be very smart about how we approach this. Mm. Yeah, and I think he was in that in caught off guard because, as I said, everyone had kind of been expecting that I'm very I'm a very reliable player and things come very easy to me and I'm you know I'm always and kind that of was your point. breaking point and because yeah. I broke the, everyone was like, oh my god, yeah, she broke, you know, like but I, <laughs> also like it's not it's not oh my god she broke it's like as I say like this is what happens to everyone and the experienced people like him were yeah. he wasn't so much shocked that it happened he was just like okay. This is the moment. It's finally here. Yeah. It happened and we're going to work on this. Of course, from your perspective back then and also from mine, it was like, oh no, it's happening to me. Like, what is that? But we never saw it as the necessary step that we need to go through. He Mm. absolutely saw it as the necessary step, which of course we know now. We didn't know that. But for him, it was just like, okay, the moment arrived. um, Let's deal with it. And I mean, the way he dealt it, the, the way he dealt with it was... Yeah, beautiful. But let's get into but, that yeah. later. So um, first, tell me, like, your like startup of that whole. Thing. I mean, my startup, it it wasn't a build up at all. For me, it was just one failed performance. And which one um, do you remember? It was in the first one. Actually, wasn't dramatic at all. It was in performance practice. It wasn't a high pressure concert. Mm-hmm. It was just it didn't work out. You know, it was a piece that was, I would say, the thing that started uh, my difficult phase. Exactly, uh, which is, it was a hard piece for me at yeah. that age to play and um, a piece that I was afraid of for a very long time and actually, a little fun fact, I played it again about four years ago, I think. I started playing it again in the program and now I feel super comfortable playing it. <laughs> but even four years ago, which is 
yeah. what over 10 years since this happened, I was unsure whether I was supposed to program it. I was thinking like, okay, should I, should I do this? Yeah. And I did it. It was like overcoming a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a big fear. <laughs> but no, I, I, I started playing that piece in, in performance practice and it just failed time after time. And um, the first time it failed, it was like, okay, play it again tomorrow. It failed again. And then instead of getting better, it was getting worse. Mm. It was getting worse and I started being more afraid and more afraid and it just developed from there. Like I couldn't mm -hmm. master that piece. I just couldn't get over it. And no matter what happened, I couldn't. And this happened the next master class. Okay, play that piece again. I couldn't. And with other pieces, I was fine. I could play other pieces, but that piece, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I could play, I remember I was playing Beethoven Sonata at the time, totally fine. But that piece, I could not master somehow mm -hmm. I had a major block in my brain mm -hmm. and then that block got way worse because what happened with me was he kind of so our teacher for a while I would say stopped believing in me for like one or two years and this mm -hmm. was a big thing for me so our journeys were a bit different yeah. because he kind of said, okay, you're going to stop playing in the final concerts. Mm -hmm. you're, I'm going to stop, you know, because basically there was performance practice and then there were the final concerts where only the best students played. And for one or two years, I never appeared mm -hmm. in those. I, I didn't because... I also stopped playing in the final concerts though after my... After that big thing for, but only for a short while, I think for a short yeah. while, but, but you know, for yeah. me, it was like a long phase that I didn't because there, I mean, rightfully so because I wasn't supposed to I couldn't and and I just remember you know there being these awkward situations where people were like so are you playing are you playing because up to then I was always one of the people that were playing mm -hmm. and then I was like uh no I'm not playing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then I remember you once asking me you know in a very like I think I don't think you meant anything bad by it, but I remember you asked me like, "Don't you feel bad that you're not playing?" Are you serious? Like, oh, in your, I mean, you were so young, but Jeez. and I was like, uh, "No, it's fine. I'm totally fine with it." And of course, I was not fine with I'm it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, totally fine. But um, so for me, it was this like losing. He he kind of lost his yeah belief in me. I think, and then for some reason, he started believing in me again. And he basically what you described before where he said, OK, mm -hmm. the long road ahead, he said to me, you know, so we're going to we're going to do this now. And it started with this new piece that I was playing, which was Fantasiestücke by Schumann. And mm. um, he said, OK, we're going to tackle it with this piece. And this piece is also a huge piece. I was playing all these very difficult yeah. pieces, yeah, yeah. I find. Um and it, it is a huge piece that has, it's a cycle that has actually eight pieces and some are harder than others. Some are incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. And I remember piece by piece, we're tackling this. Some were major fear pieces for me, but, um, yeah, I would like to talk next about how yeah. he encouraged us. And for me, it was a bit delayed, like a couple of years yeah. later for yeah, you. Yeah, I think yeah, it yeah. was pretty much instant, the, yeah. the, the encouragement phase yeah. and, I think it's very interesting because his way of encouraging you had two components. The one was exposing you, exposing you to the situation, mm -hmm. basically play, play, play in performance practice. And this is what I mean when I, when I say I hated performing, I only wanted to practice because in practice I felt safe mm -hmm. on stage. I felt unsafe. And he would say, well, this is exactly what you have to go through. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling him like, but you know, I'm, I, if you're not there, I feel so much more secure, but if you're there, I'm so nervous. And he said, yeah, I remember him saying, well, you're supposed to feel secure. Even if the Pope is there, like nobody cares. <laughs> There. You should just go there and play. And it, so number one was this exposing. Uh -huh. And then number two was also really encouraging you. Yeah. Really encouraging you and telling you, you can do this. Look, really, I know you can do this. And at that point, I did not believe in myself. And he told me, and this was kind of a key moment for me. He said, look, if I didn't believe that you could do it, I wouldn't tell you to keep playing in performance class. And this was like okay, he sees something in me that I don't wow. see in me myself. Wow. Wow. And this was kind of like a revelation. It was in this masterclass in Bukkeborg, which was a place that I hated. Oh my God, Bukkeborg I have so many was... bad memories, <laughs> with, like performance practice memories with that oh, place. This, this place, like this castle, just yeah. these steps up to the hall. Yeah. Oh my God. I think if I Major walked anxiety. these steps Major today, anxiety. I would have anxiety. Yeah, yeah. yeah for, for, of course. 
Interesting. Yeah, I was I was trying to I just remembered one more thing that is interesting in terms of his priorities before I get into how he like kind of helped help yeah. me because the the big achievement that I had done before my big you know uh, season of failure <laughs> with the stage fright was that I had managed to play the twenty four Chopin pre- preludes mm-hmm. at a like significantly young age. Yeah, I remember I played them Very all for the age. first time when I was. In, in performance practice, I think I was like 13, and in concert, I think I was also 13, or maybe just I just started being 13, yeah. and it was this huge project. I started learning them when I was 11, and it I, it took me two, three years to learn all of them, and obviously I started with the difficult ones first, and then kind of, you know, filled it up, and in the end, I played all of them. And for two, these two, three years, I played them all the time. In every performance session, I would just play that piece, and or like, you know, parts of that piece. Mm. And there was one prelude... For the musicians out there, the 16th, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that was just extremely difficult. And it was, dif- for me, like for my 12 year old hands, just like the left hand was far too, you know, it was just difficult in, in all places. And I had lots of difficulty playing it and also in relation to fear before like my whole stage try. But it was kind of a very realistic, it was like, okay, obviously this piece is difficult, it's challenging, you're gonna be nervous. And I remember I played this one final concert where I played like a, a an excerpt of the preludes and I included that prelude in it and I started playing it and I, I got out like I, I I missed it so I stopped I started I kind of I stopped after the first two three bars because it's like you know my fingers ran away from control. me I lost control yeah. and then I kind of like collected myself and I started again and then I pulled it off yeah but in my mind the fact that I had stopped I was like oh my god he's gonna kill me like you know mm-hmm. like no, no, not exactly I was like oh my god he's gonna be he's gonna be disappointed and I remember I and you know then I finished the preludes I finished all of them and then when I um when I took a bow he like gave me a standing ovation mm-hmm. and I remember I was so so confused and I was like why is he giving me a standing ovation I I missed it you know and um and then he came back to me and he said this was one of the most important things mm-hmm. you know you kind of collected yourself so he was it was so interesting because he never really performed that much I mean at that point not at all but I, I'm sure he also didn't really perform that much in his youth he was a teacher through and through but he could kind of empathize with the process of performing so yeah. well. I mean, he was such an experienced teacher. Yeah, he had incredible. had hundreds of students. I think he knew exactly what what feels like. I think yeah. he also knew when something is about to come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that's why sometimes his reactions didn't make sense because his reaction was almost in anticipation yeah. to the coming phase. Like, there were some times where I thought I nailed it and then he was like, sorry, that wasn't good. And I was like, excuse me, I just mm. nailed it, you know? Yeah. And, and and kind of, you know, he, had, he understood things. What I found very interesting in how he dealt um, with that problem with me is he figured out very quickly that it was a personal thing. Like, it wasn't yeah. that I was kind of, you know, uh, not taking it seriously. I was just in my personal life, very unhappy, very confused, unsatisfied, unfulfilled. And that was what was triggering the stage, right? Mm-hmm. And it was very much, you know, connected to being unhappy and part of that unhappiness came from kind of not being able to figure out the relationship with my mom, our mom. So um, just not necessarily, you know, and, and the fact that I was kind of trying to pull away and and in in a in the wrong way and i was exhibiting kind of rebellious behavior in a way that was it wasn't making sense like i wasn't practicing well at that point and kind of like as as a rebellious gesture which was obviously like self sabotage in a way yeah. so what he did was he did a couple of things the first thing is he told me to come to the next masterclass by myself so I went by myself the first time for like a one one week masterclass. And in that masterclass, he told me, you know, you're going to come. And not only are you going to come, you're going to sit in the lessons for, from other people and write down stuff. You're just going to be there and listen to the lessons of other people. Mm. And um, I, I remember I just spent ages with him, you know, in the room, watching him teach, watching other people play. And then in every like kind of lunchtime, he would talk to me. And he told me one very interesting story that I found to this day so fascinating. He said that um, you were up until until this point, you were like the um, acrobat that is, you know, the, 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 how is it called? You know, people that go over a rope, you know, tightrope, tightrope. You were a tightrope dancer who wasn't aware of the space of the fact that you could fall, you know, you were just dancing around in your tightrope, doing the tricks, loving it. And what happened is that you fell 
And now that you have fallen, every time you're on this tightrope, instead of enjoying the tightrope, you're looking down and seeing the possibility mm. to fall. Mm. And that, that is totally normal, you know, like, but... F- you know, don't only look down, be aware that there is the space, but also look ahead. Yeah. And which is exactly what you need to do when you're on stage. Exactly. You need to be aware of the potential danger that surrounds you and the potential that it could massively, colossally fail. Respect. Exactly. Respect that. (laughs) But also just enjoy it because you can, like you've practiced, you put in the work, you can enjoy it. This is, I mean, the secret actually to, yeah. combating state fright is exactly what you just said yeah. is that and and the, and i remember like what he would do is like very consciously have me play the same piece in two different versions a, a safety version mm-hmm. he said play a safe version you know where you're kind of when you're rushing holding it back when you're you know kind of try to just play it with the target of controlling it Mm -hmm. and always end your practicing by playing one risk version and practice with risk is what he Mm -hmm. told me, you know, Mm -hmm. don't just risk it on stage, risk it in the practice room. And then when you're on stage, no matter how you feel, always opt for the risk version. Mm -hmm. And for me, I remember I had this one kind of big moment during that masterclass where I was there by myself with another piece, not the ballada, but another one that was very difficult for me, the Spanish Rhapsody by Liszt, which also just technically very challenging. And I remember I was super nervous. It was at the end of this masterclass, you know, I was kind of feeling like this was a very pivotal moment. Either I was going to move forward or I was going to like, you know, still be stuck in this space. And I remember I just took all my courage together and I said, okay, I'm going to go for the risk. I'm going to... And because the, the target was not managing it the target was not i hope i don't you know lose control but the target was i hope i risk it suddenly the control was kind of a given yeah and that's again like this this mind twist it's a mental you, switch you, you know you have to stop f- focusing yeah. on not playing a wrong note and start focusing on saying something with the notes you play yeah. and then your focus shifts and suddenly i also like to say like if you fill your mind with everything that you need to focus on musically so if you fill your mind with character uh, sound colors phrasing mm. then you don't even have time to think about the potential loss of yeah. control that your fingers can yeah, yeah, suffer yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. the interesting thing was that in the in the next few years i would say i gradually got out of it more and more mm-hmm. and i started gaining my con- regaining my confidence i mean for a while there it got that bad that I even considered stopping. I remember yeah. we had this one concert in London. It was our debut in London. And I remember telling you almost that if this is the way I'm going to feel before concerts... Yeah, I remember that. There's no reason for me to continue yeah. to do this. I mean, this is not a pleasant feeling, yeah. you know? So I even considered that, but, you know, I, I got out of it. And then I remember right around when I started studying, so when I was 18, I had this kind of emotional high around the stage. I kind of started feeling invincible on stage. Mm -hmm. I started feeling I'd had it all under control and I was just being spontaneous and I was just feeling amazing. And then I remember one year after that, I had another like breakdown Mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And it was, and, 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 and it was this experience. I was doing another masterclass. I mean, at that point, um, our, our Kemaling, Kalas Kemaling had already died. So I did this one masterclass with another teacher. And um, it was again the situation of, you know, because he already knew me, he'd kind of saved me up to the end to then like play in this kind of concert type thing. And I kind of got up kind of thinking like, okay, like let me try to get into this persona of um, a really good musician. And I just got too cocky, basically. But exactly, I was going to say, I think this has a completely different Completely different, but I just think it's important to also... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and if you're too confident, for sure, you can... And I remember, and I kind of, it it was very similar, not as, I mean, at that point, I had already, you know, many years of learning to control my fingers in spite of fear behind me. So it wasn't as big of a failure as the first Mm. time, but it would have been without the experience of kind of controlling it. I had to fall back on like panic, you know, controlling everything you had. And I remember that... Since that point, every time before I play a concert where I feel like I'm not taking it seriously enough, I'm like, never yeah. forget to respect the stage. Yeah. Never forget to respect the situation, mm. you know? And Yeah. No, for me, my journey out of it was, like, completely different. <laughs> um, because my journey took, I think, if you take it, uh, if you look at it in a complete way, I think it almost took 
maybe seven years. It was super long because it was very on and off. Mm. I had many, many, many fallback moments mm -hmm. with different pieces, like many situations where I like really went back. And I remember in my mind, I had this thing of, oh no, it's like this unnameable mm. thing you know it is back again like I'm mm -hmm. in it now mm -hmm. and I remember when I was out of it like enjoying mm -hmm. myself on stage I really in my head called it it I was like oh my god I'm having the best time in my life I'm not feeling it I like I was praying you know like to not feel it again let me never feel it again and then okay it came back mm -hmm. it was like this curse you know yeah. <laughs> and I really felt that okay when it is there I don't know what to do when it's gone I I'm fine and Of course, as you said, I had developed techniques, but it was so overwhelming that I could not combat it until that seven-year gap. And there were many situations with him um, where with new pieces, then I messed up. But it was different from back when I was, you know, 13 or 14, whenever it started, because he believed in me. Like ever mm -hmm. since I was 15, 16, I spent an entire six months abroad from home. So I studied with him at the Mozarteum in Salzburg and that was very important for me. Also, I lived alone mm -hmm. in a student dorm when I was 16 years old for six months, which was super cool for me. And also just, you know, really gave me a lot of confidence because yeah. I was managing my life alone. All the other uh, kids were in host families with curfews and I was just doing whatever I wanted. Yeah. Like, nobody was checking on me. Yeah. And, um, and also, of course, I had a huge amount of responsibility because I was studying with all the other students at the yeah. university and I was 16 and I was doing all their classes and doing performance practice every week and yeah, 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 playing yeah. there every week and and this was the moment where he really started believing in me again and in Salzburg at the Mozarteum there were many class concerts that were taking place and he always made me play in them mm -hmm. and even if one didn't go so well but actually the truth is every one of them went well mm -hmm. because he believed in me and somehow I felt the confidence mm -hmm. and um, so that was kind of a turning point for me but then everything went back like I had a horror experience when I turned 18 it was with a Rahmaninov Moment Musico where again as you it was the same situation I played last in the final concert I was supposed to be the big highlight and I really really messed it up it was yeah. that type of a situation where I couldn't move my fingers where I literally like skipped through half of the piece right. and he was so devastated he was really like How, how like where did all the work go how could this happen and I was crying I remember mm. I was crying back I remember that concert yeah the world had really ended for me and this was the last master class of like five summer yeah, yeah, master yeah, yeah, classes yeah. that we had done where every final concert had gone well and then that one mm -hmm. I completely messed up it was such a bad end to the yeah, summer yeah, yeah. and I was so sad and this was shortly before I started studying and I remember telling myself okay I have one year to make this go away and if at the end of that year I am okay and I can play the entrance exam and actually play it well, then I'll study. And if not, I'm going to study something else. Mm -hmm. Like this was what I told myself. And then that year actually went well. And then at the end of that year, I had a big tour with 20 concerts. It was called the Best of NRV Tour, yeah. um, which is the, the state that we lived in. And I had 20 recitals. I had won this thing. And, and so as a prize, basically, I got yeah. 20 recitals, which was the first time in my life that I had this intense touring experience of playing the same mm -hmm. program every couple of days. Yeah. And there I had the cocky thing because the first 10 mm -hmm. concerts got better. And, you know, usually when you play a piece, you feel more comfortable and yeah. you get better and better. And then there was the turning point where I stopped practicing it because I thought, okay, I've played it now 12, 13 times, I'm fine. And then it started getting worse. And then it started getting dramatically worse. And then to the point that I literally could not walk on stage. I just, I really, I didn't even know how to start the piece. I mean, I think like my worst moments were probably even worse than yours. Like I really, I don't know how to describe it. I couldn't even move my fingers to the first note. I couldn't even do that. And then the final concert, you even replaced me. <laughs> you came in to replace me. So... I mean, it was, again, a real big low for me before mm -hmm. that entrance exam. And then finally, for the entrance exam, I somehow managed to do it. Yeah. 
And after that, again, I had a low really? with Schumann fantasy. Yeah, with a coda of the second okay. book of Schumann. So, I mean, this is why I say for me, it was a huge journey. And I think that Schumann fantasy was kind of the final thing because that was also at the end of a master class. And he said to me, okay, so I played it in performance practice. I messed it up. And he said, you're staying here right now. And I had a recital at a pretty big festival in Germany, Festspiel in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, uh-huh. coming up maybe a week after that. And he said, you're staying here, you're staying an extra day and you left with our mom. And I stayed an extra, like extra hotel was booked, everything. I stayed an extra two days and the masterclass was over and he was just teaching me for the whole two days. Like I spent yeah, this yeah, intense yeah, yeah, yeah. working session yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that like is going to stay unforgotten. Like for me, I, I will always remember it. First of all, Of course, we were working all day. Then he started doing crazy things. Like he started throwing his keys around the room to distract me. And he said, you need to be able to play it while I'm doing that. He was throwing his keys around. He was like doing things with his hand in front of my face. He was talking to me. He was like yelling at me. He was, you know, distracting me. And I needed to do this really, really hard passage of the coda, which is, I would say, one of the hardest in piano literature. Um, I needed to be able to play it in all the circumstances, standing, sitting, like everything. And by the end of that day, I can tell you, I could play this coda (laughs) in my sleep. I mean, I could play this in any situation. And he said, okay, and now, and I was, you know, tired. We were working for like six hours, six or seven hours. And he said, and now play the whole fantasy. And the whole fantasy is a half hour piece which is yeah. so intense. Yeah. And he went to the back of the hall, which was quite a big hall. I don't remember what that place was called, you know, where the master class, it was not one of the usual ones, mm-hmm. but anyways, it, it was a big hall. Mm-hmm. And he was sitting at the back of the hall and I was playing that fantasy and I was so nervous and mm. I wanted to make him happy and I didn't even know. You know, I was like, please let this work. But I was feeling this, you know, he was there with me. Yeah. And then when I was playing through it, I got to that coda, which is 20 minutes into the piece. (laughs) That's the thing. I mean, you're not starting with it. It's 20 minutes into the piece. And I remember like, okay, I was getting to it and I got like to the point where it's going to start. And I heard him say from the back, like, okay, now like Kulakov, which was like cool head. He was just like, okay, then I cool head and play it. And I was like, you know, I'm like tearing (laughs) up right now. (laughs) <laughs> and because it's such a little thing to say, but you, you know, know it what was it like, makes the whole difference. Yeah, and I was like, okay, okay, he's there with me, and I played it, and it worked. <laughs> and, oh my god! <laughs> oh, oh my god! I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I'm like amazing. And he said, like, just cool head, and then I just played it, and it was. <laughs> And then I went to the concert. It was fine. Concert worked out well, and and everything was fine. And and that was really the the point where I I overcame it. And ever since then, I realized I had this switch in my head of you know this can happen. Like and it, you know until today, yeah. as you know, this happens. Like of course, this uh, loss of control happens, and you just need to have a cool head. And it's true. Oh my God, yeah. These these. It's amazing. I remember... And you know, had he not said that, no, I probably would have I totally, messed it up. I totally knew what I mean. I mean, he did one similar thing like that with me with one with one piece where he did the exact same thing. He, he gave a lesson to me for hours and hours and hours. Then he said, okay, now we're going to stop the, the lesson and now we're going to talk. What's going on in your life? Mm. And I remember I was like... Like he said tell me, are you not happy? What is going on in your life? And I remember, which is crazy, I admitted to him that I was consciously not practicing well. Mm. I was telling him the truth is that every second I get to myself, I feel like the only way to kind of gain back control is to not practice. That that is kind of like the only Mm -hmm. thing I have control over. So, and I told him that and he wasn't, he didn't even bat an eye. He was totally understanding. He was like, "Mm mm-hmm. And then, and I I told him, you know, I'm so unsatisfied with so many things. You know, I feel like people are not seeing me the way I want to be seen as. And, you know, it's giving me a really hard time. Remember, he told me at that point, you know what you need, Kiveli? You actually just need a boyfriend. I remember that. (laughs) I remember. I was like, um, okay, like, you know, I need a boyfriend to play better. (laughs) And he was kind of right. I needed some male influence. (laughs) No, and and I remember, like, after this conversation, he said, okay, now you're going to go practice for an hour, and then you're going to come back and play it for me. 
same situation, high pressure, you know, I practiced and, you know, super nervous that I went. But I remember for me, it was kind of, and I've had this a few times in my life, but that was like one of the first times where from like the highest amount of pressure and nerves and doubt whether it's going to go well, because I kind of felt like I had someone in my corner, from the moment I started playing, I was like, okay, this I'm, I'm swimming in some good energy mm -hmm, right now. Mm -hmm. And I, this was one of the times I remember I was super nervous, but then like kind of quickly I, when I started playing, I realized that I was in a good place. Yeah. And that kind of fueled it and, you know, kind of exponentially grew that positive energy. And, and it, it was a very, very good experience for me. Yeah. But um, I also felt that positive energy when he gave me that yeah, cool head yeah. comment. And I felt that somehow... You know, I felt like if I had him on my side, I was invincible. Mm. This was this underlying feeling mm -hmm. that I had and and this thought in my head. And and I remember when I played that concert and I went to that, I literally like whispered to myself, Kula like, Kopf. cool. <laughs> like amazing, I said amazing. that yeah, on I stage. Yeah, I totally know. And I it, mean, it did the trick. He was, I, I mean, there's so many stories that I could, we could say, share. Yeah. I mean, maybe we should dedicate, I don't know, a whole episode to just stories should, about I him. I mean, it's, it would, yeah, it's endless. There's yeah. so many stories about him, but... but Yeah, I, I, I mean, I remember these these tricks that he would kind of, and he wouldn't even present them as tricks. It's just things he would do that would just then stick with you. Yeah. Even like when you would play in the lesson, kind of like he would have these mantras in certain places, like things like relax or, mm -hmm. you know, like, or things like up, down, yeah. um, heavy Fear light eyes. lights, you know, Fear for eyes. one, yeah. exactly. Set, you know, and, and, and you kind of, and I would, we would both, yeah. we would repeat these mantras in our mind, in our language. heads. language. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. you know, saying everything is language. Oh, God, we have to do an episode on, the, an, an yeah. episode on this. I it's mean, it's so, amazing. Yeah, there's so much to say about he was, it. I yeah. mean, he was such an incredible figure. And I mean, obviously to us, but to so many people. And he had, you know, such a clear mind about just the, the complete, I would say, anatomy of being a yeah. pianist. Everything. Yeah. The technical, the musical, the performative, just all of it. It was and amazing. You, you know what I find interesting about this whole, I mean, stage fright and coming out of it thing? We now said how we got out of it and how obviously he played a very big yeah. role in that. But also... Once I ha I heard a very interesting conversation with him about it, which really made me think a lot. Mm -hmm. And because, so maybe we should say many students also found that he was too strict. You know, there was this thing that, mm -hmm. okay, Kemaling is a very strict teacher. He's too hard on his students because of this, you know, you have to play no matter if you fail, just play, play, mm -hmm. play. And some people, let's say, broke under this. Mm -hmm. And so One person asked him once, and I was with him at the table, mm -hmm. and they asked him and they said, you know, why do you do this? Why do you tell people do this until they break and then some people stop playing the piano mm -hmm. and, you know, just are traumatized or mm -hmm. whatever? And um, and he said, well, it's better to stop playing the piano and mm -hmm. be traumatized early than to go into that profession and then not be able to yeah. handle it. And he basically admitted to that person that this is his like way of you know natural selection mm -hmm. of seeing if the people can withstand it and mm -hmm. I mean it is a very tough approach it's maybe also a little bit of an old school mm -hmm. approach but I must say that looking back I'm so thankful oh, yeah. amazing. for it amazing. I, I really think I could not be where I am without it and withstand the very real high pressures yeah. of our job yeah yeah, yeah. And I mean, I don't know what you think, but I think that, I mean, to be honest, I, I know that he has this reputation of having been very hard. I can definitely think of many moments where, you know, I was intimidated definitely. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I definitely felt like, okay, this is a person with, you know, an aura. You can't, you can't mess with him. You can't mess with him. <laughs> you know, you better be prepared when you, when you go and play for him or, you know, play yeah. and stuff. but it was maybe also because of the fact that I started learning from him when I was so young, mm -hmm. when I was seven years old and I didn't have any awareness of, you know, strictness involved. I remember there were like a few times and, and also I am naturally kind of a bit more combative person when, um, when, you know, when, it, when it's not about something that I actually did wrong, when it's like just kind of teasing, just kind of, you know, like pushing I remember mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, certain things that he would tell me and I would kind of like have a rapport with him and everything. But um, I always felt that he was 
ve- he had a very human approach to it all. Yeah. Like to, to me, I can only speak for myself because I know that it must it wasn't a given with everyone. Um, and I think that we had kind of we shared this relationship of you know he knew when, it, when I, he knew me when I was so young and therefore maybe he had like a bit of a soft spot for me possibly. Yeah, for sure. But but yeah. I also think that you know he, he there were times that he was very harsh with me. I remember one um, time where I, I played and in in performance practice and I didn't play well and the reason why I didn't play well because I just I didn't make an enough effort to not rush you know like mm-hmm. I was rushing and I didn't really make an effort to hold it back properly so things kind of derailed and I went um to the, it was also in Bukabot <laughs> that wonderful little master class and I just went um because we after we would play in performance practice what we had to what had to do what was kind of common to do is you would then go back to him get like you know a quick little feedback about how he thought it was and then sit back down and then usually by the end he would then give a, a longer feedback and in that feedback he just looked at me and he was like that was a fail. Like he just told me he said that, that was, was nothing. Stupid. No, he said. Oh, he said, also said it was. But he said das war nüscht, which das war basically nüscht. is like a, a very, uh, I would say, um, un, unkind way in German <laughs> to say like that was nothing. Yeah. That was a, a, but what, a zero. What stuck with me is that and he then was he like, said this was stupid. And then he also said, yeah, he also said like this was stupid. You just rushed. You just took a wrong tempo. It could have been avoided. It was stupid. Mm-hmm. And I was like. <laughs> yeah. That was the first time he really he yeah. really told me, and I was good. And then I remember that after the uh, the, the performance practice was over, was over, he came to me and said, "But Kiveli, I want to let you know this has nothing to do mm. with our personal relationship or anything. Like this has nothing to do with what's going on between us. It was just you know on that one thing. Yeah. And and in the next that lesson, that was also he came very and, important that he kind of differentiated that that because yeah. we used to hug him in the end. That was also kind of a ritual. Yeah, and I remember that. That he said, you know, it's still like we 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 still have a good relationship. Yeah. It's not that I don't like you. It's not that I don't believe in you. But yeah. today was just a bad performance. Yeah. And yeah. he made that yeah pretty clear. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I think we both agree on the fact that he was an amazing teacher. He was an amazing and teacher, really. Yeah, I think it's it's so hard for a teacher to prepare their students for such a tough job, <laughs> which is the job of a performing musician. But he obviously had some skills because so many of his students are highly successful pianists out there right now. So he definitely knew what he was doing. And I think that this, this whole little bit of tough love, let's say approach definitely is very valid in this job. I think it's hard to do it with just the pure positive encouragement yeah. you need to be very positive and encouraging but you, know, you need to also be real because yeah. and i think that if, if you're so naked on stage exactly and i mean if if it's not a teacher that's going to do it the stage is going to the stage, the stage is going to teach exactly. you and it's yeah, going to yeah. be a far you yeah. know less forgiving teacher than exactly. an actual person yeah um yeah, yeah. it's very and I have to say, do you also want to talk about the transition from him to our, then our second teacher? Um, I thought that we should kind of end it here because we were okay. already talking for such a long time. But I mean, it's definitely somehow not a completed episode. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, let's, shall we keep this for Musical Journey Part 1? This is a okay. like, good end for Musical Journey Part And then Journey maybe next week we do and then next Musical week Journey we do Part 2. Musical Journey Part 2, which starts with our yes. next teacher, which is a whole other... I think Absolutely. and I think also of, also kind of also start at the beginning of what I would call a more conscious career versus, and also exactly kind of our professional yeah. life for me in a way it started with Kemaling a bit earlier already, yeah, yeah. My but because life, he yeah. Karen's Kemaling died when I was in my last year of school yeah. and you had already studied for two I had years. studied for two years exactly. exactly but I was already performing yeah I mean we, we were both performing we were both performing but it was it was more of a like I definitely, like, you know, after I stopped school, I feel that there was a shift, you know, in yeah. terms of... Because then it was the only thing we were doing. So it was kind yeah. of much more conscious, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But you were already out for two years, I was so you had already been doing stuff. I mean, stuff. I had, like, done already three or four recital programs. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, I had done course, piano concertos, course, course, like... Course, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I definitely feel that. And then there is also, by the way, much more to talk about in terms of, like, you know, our first piano concerto experience. Yeah, there's so much you to know, talk about. You know, like, first <laughs> concert. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think in, in part two... Two, let's let's focus on the first whole second half and second half let's and see then what, what else we come up with exactly maybe even the business side of it a little bit yeah yeah so i mean obviously so many this things is, 
a lot we can unpack. <laughs> so, um, yeah, should we say some stories also yeah, about each other? Yeah, definitely say. Okay, say, say so what's I have your, a what's very your story one? about me. Okay, so basically, I I don't know if you remember that, but it was right around you know my my darkest stage fright years, where every concert was a huge challenge. And I was playing this one concert with a piece that was, you know, any piece was challenging at this point, but it was, again, like, you know, it was a technical piece, so there were very challenging parts in it, and I had, like, a couple of places I was specifically afraid of. And I had these mantras of, of Karl-Heinz Kemmerling in my mind that would kind of help me get through it, this kind of, like, you know, really breathing with the beat and keeping the beat and kind of thinking about it in a very musical yeah. way. And... Um, I remember there was this one concert, it was also a final concert situation, and I kind of asked you, because I remember that the, 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 it was a, a hall where the um, grand piano was here, and then the, the door was right next to it, and behind the door was kind of the backstage mm -hmm. area. And I don't remember if I asked you or you kind of offered or was kind of a given or what was the situation, but I said, you know, I know I won't be able to hear you. I know that, you know, it's not like you'll be able to say that and then I'll hear it on stage, but can you please, in these difficult places be behind the door and breathe with me you know and just breathe in say these mantras with me you know like think musically with me and that's gonna help me and I don't know if you did I, mean, I know you did it because you told me yeah, you did it I mean, but I, 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 I actually thought it that made you were this huge me. difference it was also this like uh, one of these fasting where I was like going like one two three exactly four. yeah, yeah and yeah. I feel like I was going like quite quite loud. <laughs> I mean, I, like I, in my mind, you were yeah, hearing. No, I mean, I, I, I didn't hear you, but I mean, I, I just pictured you, and it was just you know one more energy working towards the positive development yeah. of the piece. You know, you know, this is also a thing that we used to do if if we played with the score in performance practice, yeah, which sometimes yeah, 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 happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I was turning your pages, or you were turning yes, my pages. Then the page turner would always be like. I yeah, was like yeah, really yeah. helping. Yeah. And, and for a while we also started doing it when we were playing duo. Exactly. When there, exactly. Were, there was this one Mozart sonata we played when, when we were very young yeah. and had like some technical things and we would always like, kind of do this for each other. Yeah. You know? yeah. Exactly. So that's yeah, my it's story. Like the power of having the other sister there was a huge yeah. thing. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. it took away so much anxiety, yeah. I feel. Yeah, yeah. I if mean, you it was were there, a huge difference. Huge thing. Yeah. Huge thing. I mean, there was even one competition where you turned pages for me and did yes, it. I remember Jesus. that. Yes. yes. Um, okay, so my story is also quite a sweet one. Um, I don't know if you remember it, but it, I had a recital. This was towards the end of the whole stage fright story, which means I was already studying. I was like mm -hmm. maybe 20 or 21. Mm -hmm. And I had a recital and I had played the first half. And I mean, I was there alone. I had played the first half and I was feeling things were about to derail. Yeah. And I called you. I called you in the intermission because the only thing in my mind I could imagine that would help me was <laughs> to call you. And because probably he yeah no I mean I couldn't call I couldn't call him I somehow didn't feel confident yeah, yeah. enough to call him in the midst of my yeah. fear yeah. so yeah I called you and I said okay I don't know what to do I don't know how to play the second half I don't know how to survive the yeah. second half and I remember you telling me of course like all the classic things yeah, like think yeah. about the music but I remember you telling me just try to imagine that your fingers are sticking to the keys <laughs> like try to just you know it's like when you have these situations with anxiety sometimes the weirdest yeah. comments and yeah, pictures yeah, yeah. somehow do the trick yeah, yeah. and if you're a pianist sometimes you know what to say yeah. sometimes also you don't because yeah, every yeah, person yeah, yeah. is different but this <laughs> really did it for me on that day and I remember just going on stage being like okay I'm just gonna place my fingers on those keys and gonna really feel how I'm touching the keys and I'm just stuck to those keys yeah. and I played and I was sticking to those keys and it was working perfectly by the end of the second half I felt so comfortable <laughs> so, and yeah. it really saved that but this was one half. thing that helped me helped me a lot as well Stick those fingers Just to the keys. Sticking them. Pianists stick the fingers yeah. to the keys. Interestingly enough, now when I play, I try to get away from that image because I find that what I'm trying to do now always is whenever I feel that I'm getting nervous is I try to get super relaxed, like super loose, everything, loose fingers, yeah. loose elbow, mm. loose body. And I start to like, you know, I try to get into like a more courageous way of playing where, you know, like you're more, yeah. you play like in a more uh, throwing your fingers Next fashion. Next level stuff. Next um, level yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, but, but you know, yeah. Sometimes I divert back to that as well. Yeah, but I think that I would want to just end the episode by saying, because I think it's such an important thing and it's not said enough, that 
every single musician on stage gets nervous. Yes. That the nerves never go away. There is not such a thing as a routine where I never get nervous anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just you learn how to deal with it and you develop your methods. Everyone is different. I'm sure that some musicians get more nervous yes. and some get less nervous. Absolutely. But everyone feels this and it's not a goal to never feel it again, yeah. to combat it, but just to learn how to incorporate it. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the only thing that can truly, the only thing that makes that nerve seem insignificant is, I would say, our gratitude for being able to make music for people and our desire to communicate something yeah. that is more important than the fear, than the level of fear that you're experiencing. Only when that balance is tipped towards the meaning of your performance and not the potential fear you might have, yeah. that is when, you know, you're starting to really um, say something valuable and important and when you've got a chance to combat the nerves. And even then, sometimes the fear is just creeping itself in from and you the might back. just you might just fail. But I think we have some nice fail stories to tell of our... Um, connected to our now teacher, maybe in part two, like one very inspiring story that we're going to keep for the second part yes. of the next episode Yes, that involves him that he told us about himself. Yeah. So it's yeah, a very yeah. public one. I think it's okay to talk about yes, it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, thanks for listening and we'll see you again next week, next Saturday with part, part two, two of Lots the musical of love. journey. Bye. Bye. You're listening to The Sister Drill with Danai and Kiveli.